Well, I'm uh, president of a small nonprofit called the Acceleration Studies Foundation. We're based in Los Angeles, but we have uh, individuals in Palo Alto and New York. And we're looking at accelerating change. Uh, so when you ask it, a room full of people, do you think that technological change is eventually going to start slowing down? Because we've seen it going faster and faster our whole lives. Um, we're interested in the answer to that question. Now, most people will say to you, no, I think it's just going to keep going faster. And then if you ask them a second question, well, could it eventually tail off? Is there some possible maximum rate that we're going to hit, some saturation point? And you'll find a few people who will give you arguments for why we would hit that or why we might even hit catastrophes where we run out of critical resources or uh, some kind of a global pandemic happens or something like that. But again, by and large, most people think that those are going to be lower probability events. We need to worry about them, but they don't think they're going to be game changers, right? I mean, the only thing that could really slow down accelerating globalization right now would be a global pandemic, and it is possible. But it gets, as several of the speakers at our conference have said, it gets lower and lower probability every year the more we understand molecular immunology and, and the actual limited uh, infectious capacities of uh, pathogens like viruses or genes which, or, 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 or um, bacteria which have you know, 50 or 200 genes in their entire organism. And, and they can do a lot of things very fast, but they can't do very much with those things. So, and we're incredibly complex, multiply redundant organisms with deep immunologies to us. And we're just starting to discover what those defenses are and figuring out how to aid them. So, uh, basically, this whole question of accelerating change is what we decided to incorporate and start networking people who are talking about it. Um, start asking, what is it about the universe and the local environment that we inhabit, the physical laws such as they are, uh, the structures of matter, energy, space, and time that allow certain processes to go faster and faster every year. These are computational processes, um, communication processes, uh, technological capacities. Um, and I think a short answer to that that we've discovered is that uh, computational systems are in a special class of system. Computation is one, the one thing the universe does very well and it does it with new substrates, platforms for doing computing over time. So it was computing with replicating suns that were building out the periodic table uh, in the first few millennia of our universe's existence. And then it moved on to organic chemistry where the really interesting computation was going on, on the, uh, in the intermolecular clouds and on the surface of special planets, uh, kind of pre-organic, incredibly complex molecular organic chemistry computations. And then the computation moved to even more localized zones on special planets that where liquid water and long-term plate tectonics could survive. So planets like Earth, you don't get long-term plate tectonics on Venus or on Mars. So you might have lifelike conditions for a while, but you can't recycle the CO2 according to some of the planetologists. So the systems can't survive for the millennia that are needed for accelerating change to occur in an entirely new space, which we call life. Right? biological computation. And then you look at those systems and you see again these incre increasing compressions of time the closer we get to the present and, uh, before new significant computational events occur. Now when you're using this term computation to describe physical, uh, physical change in the universe, it's, you, know, you have to wave your hands a little bit. You have to put quotes around it. Um, the nice thing is uh, you know, the first thing you have to admit is that every particular significant emergence that you want to define, whether you're Carl Sagan talking about the cosmic calendar and how things go faster and faster, or whether you're Ray Kurzweil talking about new innovations in human civilization or technology, uh, you have to admit that any emergence that you define as important, the internet, let's say, has been subjectively defined by us as important. So there's an anthropic bias there. But at the same time, there's a whole bunch of different, now we're all humans, so there is that basic bias from our, that, the way we're filtering the information of the universe. But there's a whole bunch of different perspectives on this process that a bunch of humans have. If they all see important events, and they differ on what the events are, but they all see the compression, then you can say, well, the metrics you're using, the models you're using may be arbitrary, but the compression isn't. There's something fundamental to change that special classes of change, 
particularly technologies of computation, communication, and what I call, I and a few others call, the microcosm. Right? In those spaces, you're going to see continuous acceleration. We don't know why, but the special physics of the universe that we inhabit seem to reward accelerating computation. Mm -hmm. So you look at something like Moore's Law, and you say, well, Moore's Law is cool, right? Ray Kurzweil calls it the fifth paradigm, right, of, uh, of computing. He said, you know, we started with uh, vacuum, or sorry, we started with, uh, electro, uh, with mechanical computers in the 1890 census where we had this jacquard re weaving loom that was basically uh, do, using punch cards to do the U.S. census in 1890. Then we moved to uh, electromechan uh, mechanical relay, then electromechanical relay, then uh, vacuum tube, then uh, transistor, then integrated circuit, and that's basically the fifth paradigm of computing this uh, thing that Gordon Moore noticed in 1964, this uh, doubling of price performance or, or capacity in our, in our chips, right? Um, but that uh, acceleration, if you ask the big question, well, what's causing that? Uh, you, you actually have two questions you can ask. You can say, well, there's human creativity that's causing faster and faster computers every year, right? Smart bunches of human beings with resources and time are coming up with elegant ways to make smarter computers. But there's also human discovery. And that's humans playing around in the physics of the microcosm, doing things they don't really understand. And these unreasonable efficiencies, as Carver Mead would call them, just pop out of the physics of the microcosm, okay? The, uh, Carver Mead, of course, from Caltech, you know, he came up with this uh, prediction of efficiency. It's really Mead's Law, 1968, just about four years after Gordon Moore with Moore's Law, right? which actually came out of some work by Doug Engelbart, so some, who was also at our conference recently. So, um, so Mead's Law is something, again, that we also have to consider. Why is the microcosm so efficient? Why does it reward these stunning advances? Why were we able to make a carbon nanotube ribbon just what, a month ago, you know, uh, several inches wide, several meters per minute or whatever. How come it's so easy? <laughs> we didn't expect it to be. How come we can, how come fat-fingered 20th century human beings were able to make seven qubit quantum computers, right? How can we run a program in a single atom of calcium, right? How can we make nuclear power plants that are so incredibly energy efficient? As George Gilder, who we've also interviewed, would would say, you know, China is, is trying to build 60 nuclear power plants right now. And they're doing it because they're living in a, a kind of a, the cultural mindset they're in is where we were in the 1950s, right? They've got a bunch of engineers running the system, like the space race era. They're very optimistic about the future. They haven't, they haven't yet got to the 30 years of postmodernist angst that we that we have been dealing with after 300 years of being, being, you know, uh, relentlessly pursuing the truth as we were doing previously to that, right? We're now in this kind of swing back on the pendulum where we're kind of questioning things. So they want bigger tail fins on the Cadillacs or whatever out there. They want, you know, Chinese on the, on, on the moon, right? So they're, they're looking at the technology of nuclear power. And you know, what they're, you know what they're seeing? They're seeing incredible efficiencies in the microcosm. They don't know why they're there. They don't know why you can set up a nuclear power plant and make virtually no waste that now you can stick in, in a, something called vitrification. You, you glassify the waste so it's, it's good for tens of thousands of years before it would, if you, if you tried to break it down, you would just shatter it with a hammer, right? You'd lead shield it, stick it on some ridiculously small piece of surface area right, on the planet. It's going to be good for 10, 20,000 years where you have to worry about it. And we'll be launching it off in, you know, into space within 500, 800 years, right? It's not even an issue for the Chinese because they're not dealing with the repercussions that we had working with first generation nuclear power plants. Because first generation nuclear power plants, were, they were nasty, right? I mean, they were, you could weaponize the, uh, the waste, uh, they, were, they could melt down, and they did in, in Three Mile Island, Chernobyl, and Tokaimura in Japan. And those three small catastrophes made just about everybody else out there say, oh, we don't want to mess with that. And that's a great conclusion, 
right? And that's a conclusion that should have been made with a crappy technology, and there was one country that will not be named here that didn't make that conclusion, and they tried to make money off of a crappy technology, and they actually made the world less stable by doing that. But I have a law of technology, I have several laws of technology. My first is technology learns 10 million times faster than you do. And when we recognize that, we recognize that if we keep raising the bar for our technologies, like they're doing in uh, Europe where they're requiring take-back legislation, you know, cradle-to-cradle -cradle recycling, it's much easier for a smarter techno technology system to do that than it is for a human to do that. So if the humans raise the bar, the technology will jump over it. So that's not an issue. But we have to recognize that and we have to reward the good technologies. And we're not, in, in this country, we're not at that stage at this moment because we're dealing with this 30-year 30-year pendulum swing back where we're, we're trying to get back to that era we were, were in the 60s. And it'll happen, but it'll happen on a much more global scale than it, than it happened before because it's a completely different game than it was back then. So that's my first law. My second law is technolo technology, um, or humans are catalysts, not controllers of technological evolutionary development. And that's also a bit of a humbling law, like the first law. And that's the recognition that well, the first law make, helps you recognize that when you're thinking, the fastest thinking you can do is 600 miles, 200 to 600 miles an hour, which, as Kurzweil would say, is about a million times slower than your electronic extensions are, are doing, which means you're rooted in space and time like a plant by comparison to this. Of course, this is a pretty, pretty simple little brain, but it is doing certain things so much faster than you that you're basically immobile by comparison. Okay. So that's the first law, and that's the humbling. And the, the humbling part of the second law is uh, of, of technology. These, of course, are rules of thumb. They're not laws. They're just you know things for you to to consider and think about. Is technology learns, or humans are selective catalysts and not controllers. And what that means is, we can't stop humans out there somewhere making a nuclear bomb in their basement. It's going to happen. Okay, or trying to make a, a nasty uh, virus, let's say, something. Uh, engineered for lethality, right? Surreptition, easy air carrying, whatever. By the time people can do those things, if we play our cards right, our immune systems are going to be so good that we will live with people having the capacity to start doing that because the transparency will be so good that we'll be able to find all those individuals early on in, in them doing that and then help them out of that. And if we can't help them out of that, if we can't help them learn to be different, because human learning, you know, all of our learning has limitations in any system, right? Then we'll, we, we, will we will safely and reliably isolate them and take away the things that they could use, uh, the freedoms that they, that they could have had to, to cause that kind of damage, right? So that's the kind of a fine-grained society we're moving into. So, you know, people are going to say to you, oh, you can't stop uh, stem cell research. You know, someone else is going to do it. Well. If, if a technology, um, and I'm not talking about stem cell research, but let's talk about something like human germline genetic engineering, which is a potentially very disruptive technology. If someone out there is trying to make human 2.0, right, that, that could be very politically divisive and could make a lot of people think um, there's, there's a lot of political repercussions that we haven't begun to think about there. But you look at a, a country like, or you look at uh, Europe and with genetically modified organisms, and they've made a lot more of those choices with regard to protecting human beings, protecting human economies, protecting the tradition, the natural order, right? They see those disruptions and they don't see the positive benefits, right? So if we make that decision with regard to um, technologies like uh, germline genetic engineering, if we say, um, I want to slow that technology down, by the time it becomes possible, it's probably going to be irrelevant. By the time it becomes possible to do something powerful with it, it's probably going to be irrelevant. Because there's all these other technologies that are competing with it, like these information technologies, which are self-organizing. They're building themselves bottom up. Right? Humans are doing a lot of discovery in that process versus um, genetic engineering, where we're trying to look at a system top-down, fiddling with something we don't, don't understand, right? Most of the mutations we make don't work because we don't understand how the system builds itself from the bottom up. And what we're probably doing there, in, in some cases, is a lot of disruption with, with regard to impacts on the human environment. Now, 
uh, genetically modified uh, rice to, minima, uh, to provide a, a vitamin that stops blindness, you know, and that's a wonderful thing. And uh, there's all kinds of technology, of agro-biotech that I think is going to accelerate, right, as the, all the information from the information technology space helps us understand how to make smarter biological machines. I'm not saying that's not important. I'm not saying we're not going to discover all kinds of wonderful ways of curing diseases and taking people who are off on extremes and bringing them to the mean. What I am saying is I don't see in the biotech space that we're going to be making smarter human beings, longer-lived human beings. I think these systems are designed to fall apart at an accelerating rate after sexual maturity for deep evolutionary developmental reasons. And if we start tinkering with those systems, there's lots of potential downsides, not lots of potential upsides. And when we compare the rate and the benefits of change that are going on there versus the rate and the benefits of change that are going on in information technology, I think we may make the decision to slow down a lot of the biotech extreme, a lot of the biotech experimentation at the, at the mammalian level and above, right? except with regard to research, to understand systems to cure disease, right? But the interventionist paradigm, that's going to be limited to th the things that restore human function to the mean, right? You know, spinal cord implants for patients. Are we going to see chips that, you know, give people smarter brain, uh, brain capacities? I don't think we need anything like that. I think you're going to be talking to your computer and it's going to start, you know, answering your sentences when you have a senior moment and suggesting what the the thought is that you had in your head. You're not going to need, you know, something jacked into the back of your head uh, and the social stigma and the weirdness and the, and, the, and the class separation that could come with those kinds of things. So I think we're actually going to have conversations about these issues over the next 20 years and we're going to decide certain technologies need to be more finely watched and slowed down. Even Ray has talked about the, the importance of, uh, I shouldn't say even Ray, but Ray has talked about the importance of, of certain, in certain areas He's not saying relinquishment, which Bill Joy would talk about, but he's saying go slow in lots of specific biotech areas that, that could be, you know, weaponized, right, where there's potential downsides. Go fast in all these infotech areas because the infotech areas are creating incredible um, positive sum benefits for all of us. And they're moving bottom up millions of times faster than us. And this gets me to my last law, the third law of technology, which is the first generation of any technology is usually dehumanizing. The second generation is often indifferent to humanity. So there's benefits, but there's drawbacks, and it can often be a wash. And with luck, the third generation is net humanizing. And that's where nuclear power is today, I think. I think George has, George has figured that one out, and several other, some environmentalists now have come over to the nuclear side because they see how it's going to eliminate the global warming problem. But why do we live in a universe where it's so easy with a third generation nuclear power plant that, you know, a pebble bed reactor that, that can't melt down, it's designed to be, you know, for that to not be possible or extremely low probability, right? Uh, where it's so easy to store the waste, can't be weaponized anymore. And where the system is so clean, sure you have this dirty stuff, but there's so little of it. And how much crap is created by every other energy platform we've ever looked at? Far more and far less concentrated and far less efficient, right? Why do we live in, a, live in a world where so much energy can be gained by cracking an atom, right? Those questions haven't been, been asked. So our organization wants to bring people together to look at these issues because if every new generation of computing system uses less matter, less energy, less space, and less time than the previous platform, then guess what? We're going to continue on that accelerating curve right, you know, through the roof or down the rabbit hole, whatever way you want to look at it, right? For reasons we haven't yet figured out. But it's really interesting, and there's a lot of optimism to this model. As, as Werner Vinge would say, you know, the singularity is kind of a, a congruence of radical optimism, right? Uh, the kind of, the technological singularity, the kind of abundance that we're creating if this model is true. And that'll help us understand that, sure, even though we may discover we're living in this world of radical optimism, we still have to choose the path that we're going to take, right? Which technologies do we accelerate, catalyze, and which ones do we slow down because we don't want that kind of future, right? And I'm not going to say I don't want a future with people with, you know, that are part cyborg or whatever, but I don't want a future where people feel discriminated against. 
and I don't want a future. Now, of course, people would say, well, I have a right. You're discriminating against my right to stick something in my head, right? And there's an argument to be made there, too. But the more closely we look at these, I think we're going to say, if the net effect of this is divisive, if the net effect of this is creating class separations, uh, if the net effect of this is um, discriminatory, we're not going to want that because we're living in a world already where there's going to be accelerating returns. You turn away, you look back, the world's going to be twice as interesting for the rest of our natural lives. We don't understand why, but I think we're going to start understanding that more and what our organization wants to do is bring together the people who are talking about it, do um, programs in technological road mapping, um, get more master's pro and PhD programs in technological road mapping because it's the closest to what we call acceleration and developmental studies, which is this question uh, I was referring to earlier. You've covered it all. Thanks. Well, thank you. Yep.